The Trinidad years, which 1941 to 1948, were for Middlehouse a bit of sweet years. It was in Trinidad that he met and married Roma Halfhide, his severest and most valued critic. Theirs was a whirlwind love affair. Writing to a friend in 1942, he remarked, since, since March the 25th, when I was married, I have known such happiness as I'm not accustomed to. Middlehouse had arrived in Trinidad from Guyana as a naval rating aboard the ship HMS Helen. Having met Roma, and in order to remain with her, he is said to have feigned illness until the ship departed without him. He was subsequently appointed to the position of orderly in the quartermaster's office at the Port of Spain branch of HMS Benbow. Though described by Middlehauser as one of the blackest and the most unpleasant interludes, this period of his life remains shrouded in mystery. Research has, however, revealed that only a few months after his marriage, on the 5th of July, 1942, Middlehauser wrote to Captain C.C. Dennison complaining that he'd been transferred back to headquarters for AB training by the monstrous tyrant, Lieutenant Commander Wilkinson, on wages which did not sufficiently cover his domestic expenses, the needs of the other naval ratings, or indeed the needs of his wife. Whilst Dennison's response to this letter is not known, Middlehouse's position was firmly articulated. No, I cannot tolerate this. Shortly after this posting, I shall give myself up for arrest and will come before you for trial. It is a price I must pay for having left my civilian comforts to come forward voluntarily and offer services to the empire. In fact, I shall accept many more such sentences of imprisonment, for I absolutely refuse to give service under a commanding officer as Lieutenant Commander Wilkinson. And no matter what suffering I may have to undergo in future, I shall never be shaken in this, reserve, in this resolve. According, according to Sam Salvon, a Trinidadian uh, novelist, friend, and fellow TR NVR naval rating, Middlehauser, when informed by the lieutenant commander that he could not leave the Navy so long as he was wearing the king's uniform, stripped himself naked and walked off the ship. <laughs> Middlehauser was discharged on medical grounds in August 1942, presumably as a result of this incident and was for some time afterward, afterwards kept under naval surveillance. Some sources claim he was put under surveillance on account of fascist sympathies. Others cite communism. Both are possible. Back in Georgetown, he had referred to himself as a communist. But his attachment to all things German might also have suggested fascist leanings. And I should have actually explained earlier that his mix is German, French, English, African. So, and obviously the name Middlehauser is, is German. Um, so without concrete evidence, uh, one can currently only assume that these claims are the product of local speculation, gossip, whatever. But the result, however, of unfavorable reports from naval intelligence was that Middlehouse has spent a significant amount of, in, of his time in Trinidad living as a stay-at-home father. He had worked as a stock clerk at the Planning and Housing Board until April 1943, and then as a receptionist at the Queen's Park Savannah Hotel from July to September 1943. He was a part-time writer for the Trinidad Guardian between 1944 and 1946, and appears to have been employed as a clerk to the Harbour Engineer of Port Services from 1946 until he left Trinidad, left Trinidad for the UK in 1948. The point here is that Roma, his wife, and a stenographer, became the full-time breadwinner for a period of at least three years. George Lamming, another novelist, reflecting on this period recalls, his wife went to an office and he did the housework shopping and the lot, leaving him some seven or eight hours a day for writing. They didn't call him a witch, as the French peasants regarded Joan of Arc, but they said he wasn't altogether right in the head. 1940s Trinidad was, in some respects, an enlivening and enriching experience for Middlehauser. He joined the Readers and Writers Guild, a literary group that was chaired by the Irish judge, Sir Eric Hallinan, 
and attended by the likes of Ramon Fortune, Arnold Tomasas, A.C. Farrell, Ernest A. Carr, Gaston Law, Neville Giuseppe, and Sipasad Naipon. It was during his time in Trinidad that he also became acquainted with the likes of Alfred Mendes and Frank Collimore. He began helping the latter to promote um, BIM, uh, which is uh, a regional magazine, a literary magazine, in Trinidad with positive results, and began submitting short stories for broadcast to the BBC's Caribbean Voices program. But it was also a period in which the function and future direction of culture and literature was being hotly debated. Though Middlehauser was very much a part of these discussions, one can already sense his anxiety as anti-colonial nationalists in favor of Afro-Caribbean folklore or proletariat-based social realism predominated. So writing in the Trinidad Guardian on 19th March 1946, he argues, an artist can only achieve greatness when he is capable of standing by and portraying with sympathy and understanding the feelings of all humanity, king, fascist, communist, liberal, bourgeoisie, and beggar. An artist's purpose should be to cultivate a universal understanding, both of nature and of human beings. Balzac, in his comedy Humane, and John Goldsworthy, in his Forsyth saga, produced masterpieces that will survive. And these artists were not afraid to treat of the middle class folk. This is the spirit in which an artist should work. Let him paint the common man by all means, but let him also remember that there are other people that go to make up a community. Another article, West Indian Culture Needs Firmer Basis Than Calypso, written in November 1945, clearly reveals that he was out of step with the prevailing mode, not only of Trinidad, but also of other islands like Jamaica. In arguing that calypsos should not be regarded as masterpieces of music equal in grandeur to the Eroica or Guttaramada, and he was obsessed with Wagner, I have to say, um, but people then began to view him as a sort of colonial mimic man. He was indeed advised by the editor of the Trinidad Guardian to cease publishing his views under his name. Perhaps the editor hoped to prevent the debate from getting personal. But characteristically, Middlehauser took umbrage and would not agree to what he saw as censorship. He instead stopped writing for the newspaper and set his sights on moving to London. 